As a believer in Christ, we're called to follow after Jesus and go and make disciples. Upon this, we're called to be fully devoted and true. What does that look like, though, in our everyday life? And what does it mean for the church? This is a podcast dedicated to teaching and discussion surrounding the subject of discipleship. Hello, everyone. Good to be with you wherever this finds you today. Joining us for our 10th podcast is Keenan Shelton, a director of talent management, public relations for the Minneapolis Public Schools. I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, so grateful for you taking the time. Thanks for doing this with me, Keenan, and good to see you. Same, same here, Nick. Uh, I appreciate you having me this afternoon. And um, just for a little point of clarity, uh, I'm just the director of talent management. No, no connection to public relations. I want to make that clear. Okay, all right. So my folks in public relations don't come back and. Uh, say that I misrepresented myself. So, oh, of course, sorry about that. Now, no, now no. we're friends through our daughters, and and over the years, our families have gotten to know one another. Your wife Katina and my wife Shelly are, are friends, and and that's actually through our daughters through gymnastics. But I bring that up because we've had some discussion before when yeah. we, when we're sitting at meets and and we're talking through some of the things that are going on, either with work or that sort of thing. And we've had discussions, maybe sort of semi sort of along these lines before about our community and how you work in Minneapolis but also how you're 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 a coach you're a basketball coach and a father and boy that that's discipleship and and so I'm we're going to talk to that but but first I think it would be appropriate to say with all that's been going on in the last 2 weeks I want to talk about your perspective sure um and you know, before I read what 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 I was going to do, um, why don't you just share with me just a little bit of, of of your heart and what what it's been like over this last week and a half, two weeks for you and your family, and and maybe talk a little bit of about your background so I get so we can all get to know you. Sure, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so my background is is it. It, 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 it extends deep. I'm still a young man, um, but on the on the work side, on the professional side, uh, a lot of the work that I've done over the past uh, 20 plus years has been focused on professional development, and it's been professional development with uh, adults. Um, and when I talk about professional development, it really has had a distinct focus around building core leadership skills that mm. are conducive to uh, organizational workspace, whether it's in the public sector, private sector. Um, or any industry. Um, so that's really been a, a huge part of my focus over the past 20 plus years from a professional standpoint. Um, as you mentioned, I also coach high school basketball. That is my, my, my true passion. Awesome. Uh, second to being a father and a husband, um, yep. high school or coaching basketball is, is really my passion and something that I thoroughly enjoy. Um, so <clears throat> that takes you a little bit into my background on a personal mm -hmm. level. Um, I'm born and raised in Detroit, Michigan, um, spent my youth there up through high school before I went to the University of Wisconsin. And once I graduated there, and I should say the University of Wisconsin lacrosse, I uh, graduated there in 97 and I made my, my transition to the Minneapolis area. And I've called Minneapolis home for the um, past, what, 20, 23 years now? Wow. Wow. Well, we had talked a little earlier too about, um, and, and I didn't expect to talk about this, but you had said, you know, one of the things that's been probably emotional for you, um, difficult over these last two weeks, but also really important for you is talking to your dad about what he grew up in. Could we talk about that for a minute? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I share it with you. Um, my dad, who still resides in Detroit, um, he, he's, a, he's about to turn 70 in just a couple of weeks. And we were talking uh, awesome. a couple of days ago. He's obviously familiar with, with what's happening or what has been happening here in the Minneapolis area and across the nation. And he, he just brought a little bit of perspective um, in regards to what we're dealing with today and what he experienced as a teen um, during the 1967 riots of Detroit. Um, <clears throat> and again, uh, what he described for me was uh, a little bit more than what we experienced um, over the last 10 days. Uh, wow. Similar, um, uh, I guess the, the issue was similar um, where, you know, there was a lot of 
police brutality. In addition to that, um, just injustice um, uh, with the black community in the Detroit area. And what he described for me was just a, an uprising at that time. Mm -hmm. And um, as a teen, he didn't partake in some of the activities that were, were happening um, on the streets of Detroit, but he was uh, fully entrenched in what was going on. And he, you know, he described for me a city in chaos, which we saw mm -hmm. over the last 10 days here in Minneapolis. He also described um, what we have heard our, 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 the guy that sits in the White House, what he described as a potential means to curb some of the activities of our youth and the people that were protesting and, and, and rioting, uh, where there was a tank on one end of the corner and a tank on the other end of the corner um, back in 67, right outside of his home. Wow. Um, so, you know, his perspective and his connection to what, what is going on here in Minneapolis differs a little bit. And I think you and I talked about, Nick, this really hits close to home because Minneapolis is home for us. Right. Um, you know, had this been a situation that happened in San Francisco, I don't know that we'd have the same perspective around yep. it. We still honor the George Floyd of San, of San Francisco, right. but it may be honor in a different way. And that's what yep. my dad was explaining to me when it's right there in your neighborhood and it affects your people within your community, yeah. you tend to have a little bit of a different perspective around it. No question about it. Um, I, I really appreciate you going back to that because I, I, I just think that's so important for me and for us all to hear. And uh, one thing that really stuck out about our previous conversation uh, was that I called it unbelievable what's going on. And, and it is. <laughs> but you said, and this is so important, you said, you know, on the other hand, it's really not, though, because this has gone on for far too long. Or it, you had a little bit different way of uh, expressing that. Why don't you share that? Sure. Uh, you know what? I, and it certainly uh, appears unbelievable um, that we're, we're in a time where we're still experiencing the injustice and the police brutality and, and what we've seen over the past 10 days here in the city and across the nation. Um, but I think I responded by saying it's absolutely believable because we've seen it all too often. You know, back in 2014, the Eric Garner situation out in New York, very similar circumstances, black man killed by the police um, in, a, in a very similar manner. Um, so when things, when, when these situations continue to occur, um, you know, it, it makes it believable for us in the African American community. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, our hope is that the, the, the movement and the momentum that we've seen with the George Floyd situation and how not just the nation, but the world has gotten behind this movement. And I, I don't want to um, devalue it by calling, calling it a movement. Sure. To honor him in the way that the, the, the nation and the world has, you know, the hope is that we will see progress and progress in many different ways, not just with um, you know, police brutality, but progress with our educational system, progress with um, you know, just the, 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 the relationships that we build with each other as, as humans and as a community. Yeah. Um, we want to see progress in many different ways. And I think this is probably that point in time that we're going to start to see that movement. Mm -hmm. Progress is a key word there, and, and I want to get to that. So let me start by saying this. I want to read for you something that uh, a ministry leader and a friend of mine wrote, Carl Nelson at Transform Minnesota, an organization our church uh, uh, supports. And, and he wrote this on the recent events in Minneapolis. We continue to be shocked and horrified by the death of George Floyd and the circumstances surrounding his murder. We're heartbroken for his family and friends and community. We call for justice. Um, the church holds great responsibility to lead with immediate and committed action. While critical, it is not enough for the church to simply call out racism and reject it as evil, which of course it is, and, and divisive. Expressions surrounding George's death are outpourings of unheard and dismissed pain. George's death is not 
an isolated incident, but a part of a deeply saturated history of systemic racism and injustice. We see this history and we, he's talking about believers in Christ, the Christian church, in this case, the church here in the Twin Cities area. We mm -hmm. lament the complicit role the church has held in the history of racism, it is clear that this week's events are part of the cost of our silence and of our complicity. Um, first of all, how might you respond to that? And, and how can you help us pastors, leaders, um, um, those in the church understand this issue better? Because as you talked about, you have that perspective from, from the schools and from training and leadership. And, and yet, we know it goes far beyond that, and, and it goes, and, and as we, we talked briefly about some days ago, um, we talked about how without the hand of the Lord stepping in, there mm -hmm. will never be peace, there will never be rest, um, there, there, there will not be forgiveness, all, all of those things. But how, how do you might respond to, to what he wrote and, and what we're talking about today? Well, I, I think it's Mr. Nelson, correct? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think he's spot on. Um, and uh, as it relates to, um, you know, systemic racism and injustice, um, it, it doesn't just relate to, it doesn't just connect us to the situation of the past 10 days and what, what transpired with the murder of um, <clears throat> George Floyd. It does go, uh, obviously, much deeper than that. And um, when we talk about silence being complicit, complicity, um, that there, there is certainly some truth to that. Um, and I think as we, as we look at it, it's important to understand that, um, you know, I think that the church opens its doors to everyone um, and, and everyone has an opportunity to come in and, 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 and fellowship and hear the word and, and, and understand the word and live the word. Mm -hmm. um, I think where we, we fall short at times is really taking an active role yeah. In breaking down some of the systemic system or the systemic racism and injustice um, that we that we know exists within our community. Uh, unfortunately, it takes a situation, a sacrifice of one's physical being to move us. And, you know, we we've seen it happen many times and the actions don't typically follow um, you know, maybe, maybe what's in our mind and, and, and that's where we fall short mm -hmm. and oftentimes arrive exactly where we are today or exactly where we were, uh, on Monday, uh, May 25th. Yep. So I think as you, as you think about the church and not just the church, but many institutions and many organizations and people in general, it's important that the actions now, one, again, build the momentum and sustain that momentum towards breaking down the systemic racism and the systemic injustice that we've seen with, um, you know, black people, brown people, uh, people of color in general. And it, it, it really is time for our brothers and sisters of, of, um, of different faiths, of different um, backgrounds and ethnicities to come together and, and move forward with us. Um, and I think once that happens, and it, it started to happen over these last 10 days, um, and again, I think it's important to be able to sustain it and not just sustain it through uh, the end of this month. And we know that, uh, or I'm sorry, not just the end of this month, but over the next few days as the memorials are happening for George right. Floyd, um, but being able to sustain it for an extended period of time and continue to chip away, chip away, chip away at some of those um, systemic problems that we've seen, we'll find ourselves in a better place, um, not just again in the church, but in society as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. I so appreciate you saying that. I, it, it can be such a difficult thing being that, you know, America is quite a place. So, so yes. many different cultures, so many different backgrounds and, and, and it all depends on where you live too in so many cases where your perspectives come from but yes. we also know some of it's intentional you know some racism comes from intentional hate 
and, and, it, and it's learned. And so education is obviously a really key part of this. But as a pastor myself, one thing I would say is, but it goes far beyond education because if you don't change the heart, yes, nothing changes. And, and that's what frustrates, you know, many, many leaders, in, in, many pastors, you know, when, when we kind of, you know, uh, address something on the, on the outer edge on on the outside and never get to the heart of what's really at it. And I'm going to bring in Ma- Micah six, eight. Can I, can I touch on that yeah. before you move into Micah six, eight and you mentioned the heart. And, and I want to, I want to say that um, when, when the events of last week transpired, when, when George Floyd was murdered um, and we talked about me being a coach at, at the high school level. Yeah. Um, and I coach at Minneapolis Southwest High School, which if, if you know, obviously some that, that will view the podcast might be familiar with that area. Yeah. Um, you know, more, yeah. one of the more affluent, um, affluential um, areas yeah. of, of Minneapolis. Um, the, the majority of my team are, are, are you know, my players are white. Um, I've got a couple of um, black players throughout the program, sort of the demographic in that area. And the, the, the day after, I think it was that Tuesday on the 26th, I sent a note out to my players. We don't have an opportunity, obviously, to connect face to face. Right. But I found, that it, I found um, it very important to send a note out to my players, um, young men from that age range of, you know, 14 to 18. And one of my questions to them or my opening question to them in the text message that I sent um, focused on looking at yourself, looking at your mind and looking at your heart. Yeah. And if it, if it needs um, to be altered, then the time is now. Yeah. The, 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 this, the, the event uh, that took place the day prior um, tells you that you need to alter your mind and alter your heart. If for any reason you look at people who don't look like you, think like you, act like you, come from where you come from as any different than you, then we need to start shifting your way of thinking and shifting your way of believing and shifting your way of feeling. Because if we're going to move this forward together, we all have to be on the same accord. And um, again, I know you mentioned hard and that was just, that just jumped back out at me again, that that was part of my messaging to my, my, my team. Um, in regards to the incident that took place and how we need to move forward together. Well, and, and, and what an opportunity you've had as you've already invested in these guys' lives and have been doing that for years and years and years, but what an opportunity and unique opportunity you have to do this now moving forward. Yes. And so glad you share it because, because it really does fit very well with Micah six, eight. So we're, we're going to go back to that. Sure. It says, he has told you, Oh man, that's like people. <laughs> he has told you everyone what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice. You were, you were talking about that Keenan, how, how, you know, it's one thing to be in agreement and and so sometimes it's not just the it's not just the silence it's not so much silent and 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 maybe for many uh, pastors for example or or for maybe for many churches it's not that they've been silent it's not that they've said nothing or 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 stood passively or or have taken part in something that is evil or or hate filled um, but to do justice is to actually okay what are the steps it's going to take to come to a place where we actually see change, right? That's doing justice. And, and that's not just about, you know, that, that's not just about, you know, going out there and marching in the streets, although it, it certainly, it could be. Um, it, it's much, much more than that. And there is a perfect example of what disciple, biblical discipleship looks like. Mm-hmm. You immediately responded to something that, you didn't know what your, I mean, you, you didn't know for sure. And I'm, I'm going to ask, you know, you didn't know what the response would be. Sure. Um, you, that's, that's a courageous step, e- even though I, I know that wasn't hard for you, but it still <laughs> is a courageous step uh-huh. to take in, in order to do justice and, and how Micah 6a goes on to say, and to love 
kindness, or it actually means mercy there, and to walk humbly with your God. In other words, how we humble ourselves. You, you spoke to this too. If you can't look from, if you can't look within now, like man, uh, something is not right. And and it, it's it's what I'm preaching on this week uh, at Emmaus Church where I serve, and and that is that this is an opportunity for us to look here in our hearts instead of point the finger always pointing the finger it's always someone else's fault i i can see that you have already done that in your life so one question what was some of their response and how has that been for these guys well you know what i think it was um what what uh, what i asked them to do is i said you don't have to necessarily respond to me mm mm-hmm. For the sake of responding, um, you know, I never, I, I challenged them to step outside of their comfort zone. Um, yep. But you know, considering where we were with this matter, um, you know, I said, don't, don't necessarily, you don't necessarily have to respond to me, mm-hmm. but I do want you to think and reflect, mm-hmm. and I also want you to act. Yep. And whatever those actions are, again, do it um, with a genuine desire to be better. Do it with a genuine desire to help and support those who who, who may not um, have what you have. Yeah. And, um, you know what? We when when I followed up two days later and uh, you know put another message on them just to stay connected and make sure this you know this didn't fall off the table or they didn't lose sight of it after a couple of days. You know our youth are, are conditioned right now to move through things so quickly. Yeah. Uh, that you know, is for sure. There's, there's yeah. a trend. There's a trend one day, and it's a trend another day. Yep. You know, I didn't want this to be a trend. So you know, I'm so response. glad you bring that up. I'm so glad you bring it up because, unfortunately, for some people, it is trendy. Yeah. And absolutely. and and talk talk about. I mean, talk about how much that would hurt. Yes. To, you know, say, well, it's popular now, but one year later, no one even cares. Exactly. Exactly. So that's where I wanted to, and we've, we've had conversations and, you know, I get the, um, some of the responses were simply a thumbs up. You know, they liked the text that I sent over. Um, I, I had some response from some of my guys that, uh, you know, I encouraged them to get into the community that they hadn't been in and, and, and offer their physical support as well. So if you guys said, Hey coach, Hey, I'm over at Dollar Tree um, over on uh, Lake and Hiawatha or wherever that Dollar Tree might have been. And I'm, I'm helping with some of the cleanup efforts. And, and that was their way of giving back in the moment. Um, and, you know, again, my challenge and my question to them was always keep this top of mind because, um, you know, if we lose sight of it, then it, it, it certainly, you know, ends up being a trend. And that's not, not something that we want to see this matter or any other matter that involves injustice or or racism these things don't go away um racism is a disease and just like they're raising money to cure cancer yeah let's put our same efforts behind curing racism and curing injustice um because it it kills people it doesn't necessarily i mean well i shouldn't say this it it kills people physically and it it kills your soul as well yeah Um, that's right and, and people are impacted by it um Again, we can do our part in raising awareness, raising money, whatever it might be to cure this disease that we've known, uh, known as racism for, for, for many, many, many years. Yeah. Um, and and that, that's a good segue into just also, you know, speaking into um, this issue being a, a spiritual issue. Uh, because, again, we're talking about the heart here. And, um, yes, the the gospel needs to be applied to life. That's why it says in Micah 6, 8, do justice. It doesn't say look at it. It doesn't say ponder it. It says do justice. So, so in, in speaking to that, the gospel has to be put into action. Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice in going to the cross and dying for the sins of the world because of sickness, sin, and death, right? And yet, as we look at our own lives and apply the gospel to our own context today, what we recognize is that without action, nothing will change within society. 
And so that's why I say God is raising up the church to make a difference, right? But what I also want to talk to you a little bit about is this spiritual battle, because at the heart of it is certainly fear, um, unknown, but also hate. Um, also at the heart of it is, is just um, selfishness. Um, I mean, I don't know if you want to speak to that a little bit. <laughs> Well, you, you touched on a few things earlier where you mentioned, um, you know, a lot of hatred and it is, it's something that is learned. Um, you know, we don't we aren't we aren't conceived with a with a hateful soul or hateful spirit. Um, and certainly when we, we, we come into this physical world, um, you know, we're, we're not you know, you're not naturally conditioned to have hate in your heart. At least I don't believe that. Um, I think all of us are are born with a capacity, a natural capacity to love and support, and you're taught something different. Um, and, and when that happens, again, it, it it becomes a part of your spirit. And the only, I shouldn't say the only way, there's many ways to, to um, right your spirit, if you will. Certainly it can be done through the church. Um, and the, the church, in a way, um, can can lend to you writing your your spirit in your own mind. Um, so there's there's many different ways to impact your spirit, and and the, the church is certainly a foundation for that. Um, but you know, some can also use. Again, I, I mentioned the word capacity, the capacity that I believe all of us are given to shift their mind away from um, the hate and 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 uh, rebuild their spirit to move in the right direction it takes times like this mm -hmm. for us to make that shift and i you know I, things happen for a reason i'm a believer in that and uh certainly believe that you know again we've been living in some very difficult times very selfish times mm -hmm. you see it in all aspects of life you see yeah. it in all aspects of leadership and I, and I don't think this is punishment, but I think this is a way of the, 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 the world level setting and, and, and um, you know, God having a plan for us and saying, hey, we need to level set this whole place that we walk right now. Yep. Because we're, we're, we're living in some very difficult times and, um, uh, you know, it takes sacrifice. So was, was Mr. Floyd, um, that sacrifice and, and many others that sacrifice for us to move towards um, unifying and, and, and respecting each other and building a, a stronger spiritual bond. You know what? I believe that, you know, mm -hmm. as we as we look at the situation with yep. Mr. Floyd, you think about the pandemic. Um, yep. You know, that's, and again, I don't want to get too philosophical here, but yeah, I understand, uh, but yeah, that's, that's a way of saying, Hey, we're moving too fast. We need to sit down, sit down and, 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 um, you know, become more of a family, become more of a, a community and find ways to reconnect with each other outside of, you know, social media or media in general and right. moving around in, 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 in a way that is not, uh, or that in a, moving around in a way that's more self-serving um, than in a, in a than to be in a place where we are, um, you know, serving others. So I, I think those things happen for a reason. That's my, my personal perspective. Yeah. But um, I, I think, you know, there was some sacrifice on May 25th that might move us in the right direction. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I want to talk about that, but let, let's go back to one other thing. And that is, isn't it interesting that in this day and age, w whether we're talking about the social media aspect of it, but just how a culture is moving in a direction. You, you see it in your students that you're coaching sure. where it, it's, it's a very odd impersonal and yet, you know, constantly connecting culture. And this is even from that perspective, a wake up call. Yeah. Like there is no replacement for real relationship. There just isn't. Yeah. You, you can, you can pretend that you're close to someone, you right. know, who lives a world away on social media and, and you, you, you're connecting. But the truth of the matter is um, it, 
whether we're just talking about relationship, God, God made us to be in relationship and, and most importantly in relationship with him. And this is a wake up call along that line too. It really is. Um, I, I really like you bringing in that aspect. Um, I, I, I wanted to ask too, though, more along the lines of what you, you, you kind of just had shared too, you know, what were, some of the thing, what are some of the things that have been really hard for you during this situation? A little bit more personally. I know we talked about this a little at first, but you know, how has the week been for you personally? And, and, and just, just speaking as a father, as, as, um, well, I'll let you speak to that. Sure. Um, certainly within the household, um, you know, having two young ladies, um, two black ladies in my home and, and, uh, three, I should say, I'm sorry. I don't, yeah, yeah. I, I wasn't leaving my wife out. Yeah. Don't leave your wife out of here, Keenan. Absolutely not. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, you know, because she, you know, we talk about, uh, I had, I had one of my colleagues mentioned, you know, having a village within the home or within the community that really supports you during these times. And, and, and I've got my, my, my really tight and strong village, um, with my wife and my two daughters and, and they've been very supportive and we've supported each other. Mm-hmm. And that's been really important for us. And with my daughters, it's been more about education, um, helping them understand what transpired. They are, I believe, and I think most parents say this about their own kids, wise beyond their years. Yep. Um, I would agree. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. I've got, I one, would agree. I've got one who's really reserved and, and that's my oldest girl, Camille, who, who's friends with your daughter, Annika. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> and she's really reserved and she's kind of taking it in really slowly. Uh-huh. Um, and, but I, you know, when I say slowly, she's not asking a lot of questions, but I know that she understands because when we talk about it, right. She's able to um, articulate the thoughts that she has and ask good questions. And now my, my 10 year old, who's a little bit more of a, um, you know, she's got a little bit more energy to her. We'll say, yeah. um, you know, she, she would likely be on the front lines if I let her get out there. Sure. Um, and, and, and I love, I love that about the, both of them. They balance each other out and they right. be supportive of each other as well. Um, so from a, from a family standpoint and a personal standpoint, it's been tough. And the tough part comes in for me is because I could have been George Floyd. Ah. <clears throat> uh. <laughs> yeah, I'm in the same age range. And, and, and let me give you a little bit of perspective on that. Yes, please. Um, growing up in Detroit um, and, 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 and knowing the hardships that you face when you're growing up in a inner city that's, um, you know, kind of riddled with poverty and um, with poverty comes oftentimes a lot of crime and with crime comes, <clears throat> unfortunately, um, you know, some other things that, that take place. Mm-hmm. And when you, when you, get when you make it out as many of us have done um you don't feel like you've made it but you've made it out Uh and when you get to that point okay you go on to the different your next phase of life you don't expect and I'm, i'm i'm 44 years old um i don't expect to potentially die at the hands of law enforcement or for that matter any other person right Correct. Yep. You, you, you can't, you know, you get through those twenties and you, you, you live a certain lifestyle, but then you become a father, you become a husband, um, or in, 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 other, in the other order, in my case, I became a husband, became a father. And, um, you know, I, I continue my, my work with, with youth and coaching and other ways. Um, and to see this man, um, succumb at the hands of, of, of another person, Mm-hmm. Um, was was extremely difficult because we think when we've gotten to this point in life that that's not going to happen. We're going to die naturally. Right. <laughs> We're going to grow to be grandparents or, you know, again, we don't know what the plan is for us and we have to be prepared whenever that does happen. But the way in which it happened, we don't anticipate it. Wow. Um, so that's where it really hit home for me because I see that I'm not exempt. Um, and and I, I thought I had reached the status of exemption as it relates to leaving this physical earth right. in the same way that this gentleman did. Um, so that's where it was tough for me, you know, being able to unfortunately empathize right. um, with, with what, what, what the experience was. 
Um, but I'm also, I, I don't carry a lot with me and I'm always forward thinking. So with that, again, my focus became how do I connect with the young folks because they're going to lead us going forward. Right. And I just connecting with the young folks um, inside of my house, meaning my two daughters, but also connecting um, with, with those that I have good, strong relationships with. And, and that's the key right there. And it's why it relates so well uh, to what we're trying to do with this podcast. And that is like discipleship. There's different, different terms we can use for it, sure. but, but relating to whether it's the next generation or just re- make <clears throat> relationship. We, yes. we need to create that relationship in some respects and mm-hmm. we need to deepen relationship in that, in, in those respects. And, and what, what's really beautiful about what the scriptures instruct us in is that that happens, that can happen from within when we share faith in Jesus Christ. And, mm-hmm. and when we follow, as you said, it, it, talking about actually doing something about it, when we follow and obey and, sure. and follow his word and, and, and are obedient to him, um, there, there is all hope, right? Yes. Um, even though, yes, we do live in a difficult world right now, and we're seeing so much. And um, if I could touch on something really please. quickly, Nick, um, and we talk about relationships, and you know, we being a different generation uh, than than our, our our daughters and our kids, our sons, and and the the, the young folks that we might have relationships with. Um, you know, one thing that we we talk about in the educational environment and that I've just learned through coaching over the years, um, it, it's, it's important to meet young people where they are. Um, mm-hmm. You know what, we grew up maybe in an environment where our parents didn't necessarily meet us where we were. Sure. But as we've learned, um, you know, the, <laughs> the way that our, how we've raised our young our young kids is to um, be forward thinking, um, be independent. Um, they have a, access to a ton of information. Right. So we, we've got to find ways to, to meet them where they are. And that will help us foster that relationship. Yep. It's not about, it's not a hierarchy um, situation. It's, it, it is to a certain extent within the home. Right. Of course, um, yep. we can't we can't just let them run wild. But yep. um, as it relates to you know building a strong relationship, building relationship. guiding them forward, we've got to meet them where they are, not where we want them to be, and not where we are because they're in a different place. So that's important, and, and one thing that I always talk about, not just with um, you know from a coaching standpoint, but we talk about it quite a bit. Uh, again, as I mentioned in the educational space. Uh, um, and, and talking with some of our leaders, you know, that's how we connect and build authentic relationships is to meet uh, authentic relationships is to meet the young folks where they are. Yeah, that is so important. And, and, it, and it goes with Micah 2, 3 here, walking humbly, um, you know, God's people do depend on, on him, not their own abilities, not their own, mm-hmm. not, it, because we're not in control. He is. And, sure. and just even as you talked about, um, God works things out for reasons that are far beyond us. He doesn't wish ill, you know, ill and, and, and hardship on people. That's a result of sin, but, but he will use it. And, and you believe that things happen for a reason. I I would say the same thing, but as we meet young people, like in your case, um, and, and, and our sons and daughters where they're at we we will build a relationship that is so key yes uh, if if you want to mentor and you really care about mentoring no matter who you are where you are if you meet someone where they're at it's pretty likely you'll be able to build a relationship and that's what god wants us doing and i'll share one more thing around yeah. that and i've used this um <clears throat> I guess we can call it an analogy when, when I'm, when I'm working with adults around building relationships with other adults, adults around building relationships with the youth and young people um, in the coaching environment when, or even as a father. And I, I made this declaration um, and I shared it with a good friend of mine um, 
who passed away. He was my, my best friend passed away about mm. a year and a few months ago, back on, um, wow. back in March of, uh, March 9th of 20, uh, 2019. And, um, you know, one thing that he always reminded me of that we talked about is we talk about life in stages and how, you know, we live our, our young lives the way that we live them. And then when we have children, we fully relinquish ourselves to our children. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I talk about that, you know, mm-hmm. my, my, my time here on earth for the last 16 years, my wife and I have been, you know, devoting ourselves fully to raising right. a, um, you know, a couple of great young ladies and, you know, impacting others along the way. And I talk about that in, the, in, in my, my leadership training that I do as well. When you assume the role as a leader or you're anointed into that role as a leader, Mm -hmm. you relinquish your own, you you humble yourself. Yeah, as you you describe in Micah uh, 2, 3, you you relinquish yourself to the people that you support. You are not their manager. You are not their director. You are not their boss. You relinquish yourself to supporting them. And that's one thing that I try to stress to new leaders or even, um, you know, more and more experienced leaders who may not have heard it from that perspective. And that's one thing that always seems to resonate with a lot of folks, right. relinquishing yourself to the people that you're responsible for supporting and leading. If you really want to see them grow, if it's about you, you're in it for the wrong reason. Yep. If it's about them, You've done it for the for the for the right reasons. So well said. Um, w- one thing to, um, and and allow me to encourage you a little in this. Um, <laughs> it, you can be the greatest leader ever for the the guys on the team. You can be the greatest leader ever at, at the workplace. But if you overlook what God has given you right before your eyes in your very home, you sure. are failing, right? Sure. Because That is who God gave you, you know, Mm -hmm. and that's first as a husband and then as a father. Mm -hmm. And I I can't say it enough. And I say this, you know, so that I hear it. So that everyone else who is listening to this, here's, here's this, you, that is where it begins. It begins with, with those God has placed right before you, your own family. So, so, you know, parents, disciple your kids first you know yes. lead your kids first yes. and 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 then following that then then go into uh, the context that god has put you in and and i i just want that to be a reoccurring theme in everything we're talking about absolutely um i am so grateful that you joined me uh i i think we we might have to before we just talk on and on and on we might have to do this again <laughs> I'm open to it. Um, okay. I hope I you will be. It. I hope you would be. I really appreciate you taking the time. And before I close in prayer, I just want to say like going back to the thought of, I hope and pray this isn't a fad and, and that we're not just, we're not, even you and I aren't just talking about it because right. of what's recently happened. And yet we know it's going to, it's going to affect us and we need to be talking about it. But, you know, I can see months from now, a year from now, us uh, talking through this again and, and asking ourselves, is, is it happening? Yeah. Are, are we actually doing justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly with our God? And, and is the church leading in that? And, and in, I guess in our, in more personally for us, um, uh, are we doing this in our own homes? <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, let me close in prayer and then I will let you go. Thanks, Keenan, for being being on the podcast with me. Thanks for having me, Nick. Yeah, my pleasure. Father God, so grateful, so grateful to be with my brother Keenan and and just um, be talking about obviously a very heavy subject. And yet, you know, as, as we think uh, through God, what you're doing and we don't we don't have all the answers nor do we always understand um but knowing that lord you're going to use this situation for your good i just pray that over over keenan his work his family his his influence in so many people's lives and i just ask you to bless and keep him protect him 
and use him, Lord, like you already are. Use him as a powerful, powerful leader in your kingdom. I pray this in your name. Amen. Amen.